when these early settlers came, they, they were capitalists. They came with money. Since they didn't have to buy the land, they could invest. Duwamish village at Renton. That was uh, the largest village. That was the most powerful village. That was the wealthiest village. That was the village that lived at the crossroads of the rivers and the lakes. Right at the center of information and things. So they would drive the Indians out, take over the villages. So the Indians became refugees in their own land. To compensate for the loss of a part of their subsistence resources, they, be they became part-time wage earners. The Duwamish River continues northward until it reaches the industrial waterway surrounding the port of Seattle. This stretch of shoreline is one of the most toxic and polluted in the region, a testament to the industrial practices that allowed Seattle to become the city that it is. Your typical Superfund site used to be factory, pipe, Superfund site, right at the bottom of your pipe. That's not what we have here. We have what's called a mega site. We have a five, five and a half mile stretch of river, end to end, that's being investigated for cleanup. This is one of the largest Superfund sites in the country. The river was listed as a Superfund site because of an accumulation, a legacy of toxic pollution that has built up in the mud at the bottom of the river. We don't see a lot of, uh, if any, uh, natural shoreline as it originally was. The entire uh, estuary here has been straightened uh, and dredged to uh, make way for large ships to come in here. The legacy of the industrial um, history down here has been really hard on this area. We're talking about a hundred years of contamination from the industries that's in this river. That's not a question at all. The controls that are on the industries here mean that it's okay for them to pollute. But um, it's an interesting transformation from people who, the Duwamish, who lived very much with the river and they definitely influence the river and use the river, but there is not the expectation that they can change the river in any way that they see fit. They, it's not that over time, they were here for thousands of years, that they couldn't have figured out how to do it. It was that as they looked at the river, they took it on its own terms and used it in a way that was sustainable. Part of that is that their population was much more in sync with the space. And part of that is just a worldview, that you don't necessarily take a space and completely transform it for human use. Without this pollution, there had never been a modern Seattle. The metropolis and its byproduct are inseparable. The port of Seattle means to be uh, supporting the economy of Seattle. It enables Seattle to be connected to the outside world. It brings events to our community. Rather than us trying to, you know, reach out to other people, they are coming to us. The port of Seattle is a central node in the global capitalist distribution network. In 2011, nearly 2 million cargo containers passed through the terminals. During the night and throughout the day, thousands of men and women are busy making sure all of these containers reach their intended destination and that the rhythm of capital is maintained. The flow of the river and the tides of the sound have been poisoned by the mammoth ships that tear through the water, bringing corn and steel from the U.S. to China. These countless tons of commodities are dispersed throughout the world, integrating the most desperate regions into the same network of dependency and debt. The largest container facility in the Northwest is Terminal 18, located in the eastern shore of Harbor Island, the artificial island at the mouth of the river. 
Terminals 18 and 30 are owned by SSA Marine Services, a Seattle-based company with its offices on the southern tip of the island. The company is majority owned by Goldman Sachs, the Wall Street Investment Bank. Various companies compete with each other to profit the most off the boats and cargo that come into the port. The shipping companies pay the terminal operator to unload their cargo, the corporations pay the shipping companies to deliver their cargo, and the great ballet of capitalism continues to poison the land. Meanwhile, downtown, everyone enjoys the fruits that flow into the port, oblivious to the vast and intricate system that keeps Seattle filled with imported food and superfluous commodities. The port is in full view of all who travel through Seattle, and that is why it is most often ignored. It does what it does without too many problems. The pollution, the deaths at the workplace, all of it can be ignored as long as the wheels of the metropolis keep turning. You know, I look at the boats and the planes and the fishing vessels that uh, represent the port. One, they're cool, but more than that, they represent a dynamic Northwest culture that's unique. There's nothing unique about what goes on in the port of Seattle. It is the same as it is at the port of Tokyo, except on a smaller scale. Each region may be producing certain unique commodities, but they are ultimately all packed into storage containers and shipped away. Most of what is produced in Seattle can just as easily be produced somewhere else. Like coffee from Chiapas and salmon from Alaska, everything that is put on the market is equivalent and interchangeable. Everything that is put on the market can be taken away to the ends of the earth. Of all the nation states on the planet, China imports and exports the most commodities through the port of Seattle. There is nothing local about the port. It is the same everywhere. The wealth accumulates, the towers rise, and the streets crowd with cars. Capital creates the same lifeless and uninhabitable environment around itself wherever it accumulates and circulates. It cannot stop itself even if it wanted to. The nature of capital is to expand, to be put into motion. After they have arrived, the cargo containers are placed in rows and wait to be either loaded onto a boat or be driven away by truck. There are thousands of trucks that bring goods in and out of the terminals. Long haul truckers deliver their cargoes across the country traveling through the night to bring every matter of commodity to the consumer. Short haul truckers repeatedly return to the port throughout the course of a day, making around $50 a load. These drivers are the most exploited at the port, unable even to use the bathrooms. Many trucks carry refrigerated cargo containers known in the industry as reefers. Trucks carrying these containers are equipped with a portable generator to keep the perishable commodities from spoiling. These modules allow for the importation and exportation of produce and meat, making it possible for the metropolis to not solely rely on food from the surrounding area. When the reefers are unloaded at the terminals, they are plugged into the larger electrical grid and use the same energy as the rest of Seattle. Capital ties everything it needs together in a concrete and electronic web. All roads lead to the port, and every port is the same. It is the ultimate symbol of the era of capitalism, the place of dead roads where all that was organic and alive is taken from its point of origin and used to enslave a faraway population. The capitalist market is far from neutral. The capitalist market is a weapon of war.